Mark, what do you think, in your opinion, makes the ultimate human? Okay, that's a deep question. <laughs> that's deep. a deep question. What would question. you bring to the table? Um, for the ultimate human, man, I think the ultimate human lives with two main values. Right. And that's growth, I'm always trying to grow in some type of way, grow as a person, you know, grow in intelligence, maybe grow in knowledge, grow in love, but also contribution. The other one is contribution. So mm -hmm. for me, the ultimate human is someone who continuously grows as a person, pushes themselves, new experiences, mm. you know, new knowledge, yeah. grows as a person, but also grows in contribution as well, like gives back. Paint so, it forward. Paint it forward. So, for example, like Mother Teresa just came to my mind. You know, she spent a whole life contributing to others. You know, helping giving. others, giving. So, that for me, it's growth, a life of growth and contribution. That's what makes the ultimate human, in you know, whatever that looks like for the individual. Right. And why would you say that helps? Because you mentioned to me once there's a scientific fact that. Um, being grateful yeah. for certain things throughout the day and when you wake up in the morning especially, yeah. they prove that it helps you, what was it? Oh, it proves that it, it reduces the symptoms of depression and makes you just feel great throughout the rest of the day. And we've done studies that show that actually, if you're feeling down and not feeling your best, literally just writing down five things you can be grateful for, first thing in the morning or at night before you go to sleep or doing both, and really thinking about it and allowing yourself to feel will increase your well-being, your levels of happiness for up to six months. Mm. So if you do it for three months, up to like another three months later, you just feel generally better than you have done in the past. So that's something that I actually do daily and I encourage my clients to do as well. And what everyone's found is that, yeah, it's increased the well-being, they feel better, the symptoms of depression and stress just tend to dissipate yeah. because you're focusing on what's right on what's going well for you instead of what a lot of people do is focus on what's wrong like what's not working the negatives the negatives and focusing on the negatives that's what makes you feel terrible yeah whereas focusing on the positive what is working that's what makes you feel good and what we know is um dr barbara fredrickson she's one of the top positive psychologist researchers here in the US, mm. in the world actually. Mm. She came out with a theory called the broaden and build theory. And the broaden and build theory shows that if you start feeling good, if you have positive emotions, you know, you, you're having fun, like life's going well, or you're expressing gratitude, you're thinking what you can be grateful for, that broadens your horizons in the sense that you're more likely to try new things. Yeah. You're more likely to try, you're more open to experiences. Okay, it broadens your horizons. Now, because of that broadening horizons, you try new things, you're a bit more open, you're a bit more sociable, yeah. you try new experiences, that will actually allow you to build new skills. Yeah. Okay, so you broaden with the new experiences by feeling good, you're more open, because you feel terrible, you don't want to do anything. Yeah, exactly, right? you're stuck in bed. You're stuck in bed. With a hardened dice. Yeah, like, Rob, do you want to come out, you know, for a hike with me? Nah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But if you're feeling good, you're more open to experiences, and you get into- And opportunities arise. More opportunities arise, and it allows you to build psychological assets, such as sociability, such as confidence, because yeah. you've tried new things and it's worked. You know, courage all different types of psychological assets, we call them, so things that like are gonna work for you in the future, optimism, for example, yeah. these can come from the broad and build theory from actually positive emotions feeling good, and gratitude is a great way to do that every day. What I've heard, so a way of doing gratitude, what I've seen from you guys, especially you, um, is you have, like, not only can you say it in the morning, like, I'm thankful that I actually woke up this morning. I yeah. remember you were going for a, a few. But, you know, when you get food, not yeah. just saying I'm grateful that I can actually get food, but someone had to prepare that food. Right. So, someone had to make the knife and the fork and the table and the person to serve it to you. Yeah. And you can go really deep into the gratitude, right? Uh -huh. And then you really understand, wow, what a great opportunity life's given me where all this stuff's just practically handed to me. 
I don't have to go there and grow everything and then make the food and then make the tools to eat that. It's there. Mm -hmm. So there's lots to be grateful for and people always dwell on the negatives and they should be dwelling on the, I mean, they should be embracing the positives. Yeah, well, people, you can dwell on whatever you want to dwell on. Just the fact is, if you dwell on the negatives, you're probably going to feel terrible. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you dwell on the So positive. go on an upward spiral, not a downward spiral. Exactly. And that's the broad and build theory. That's exactly what the researcher, um, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson calls it. She calls it an upward spiral. I guess it's like when you, some of them days when you wake up right. and you feel, I mean, you, you have this nearly every day and I'm, <clears throat> I consider myself a very positive person. But when you wake up in the mornings and you just feel amazing, you just right. feel great, and you must have had it out there, where you're just like, you, you just randomly start saying hi to people and smiling yeah. at people and you don't right. know why, you're just actually already more social. Uh -huh. And th you could have that every day by implementing this. Exactly. This gratitude theory. I wouldn't even say it's theory, you said it's scientific. Yeah, yeah. Proven. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, oh no, exactly. It actually primes your mind to look for things that you can be grateful for for the rest of the day. So we'll do it in a minute. I'll take you out on a gratitude walk. <laughs> I'll show yeah. you some of the other things I do. So you have a walk with it as yeah, well. Yeah, for experiencing look, the sun's out or the air's clean and I'll do yeah, some. I can actually walk. Exactly. We'll go out and do it. But um, so what we found is that if in the morning you go for this walk or you write it down, what you can be grateful for, it's known as something called priming. You're priming your brain for the rest of the day to look for other things you can be grateful for. Because it's the first thing you focused on in the morning or one of the first things, it's like your mind's like, okay, let's start looking for That's awesome. everything else I can be grateful for for the rest of the day. It's a bit like, you know, when you say, um, you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm gonna buy a new car. I'm gonna buy like a red Toyota or something. Yeah. And then, if you said it in the morning, then all day you're noticing red Toyotas yeah. everywhere. Oh my god, like. It's in your reticular activation system. Exactly, it's in your subconscious mind known as your reticular activation system. So, exactly, when you write down what you can be grateful for first thing in the morning, it's in your reticular activation system or RAS for the rest of the day. So, your subconscious all day is like, oh, I can be grateful for that. Oh, I can be grateful for that. And it's building, it's that upward spiral for the rest of the day. And then, um, you know, I gotta say, like, sometimes. It, like 50% of the time, or maybe more, I don't wake up feeling amazing. Yeah. I wake up feeling, <laughs> you know, like, oh, all right, I could do with a bit more sleep. But as soon as I go out for this gratitude walk in the morning, afterwards all day, I'm like, Phew. right, let's go. You always seem happy to me. I've been here like 10 days now. Yeah. Uh, you're always up working and happy and so on. Training. I don't know if I seem happy in the you morning. You are, mate. Yeah, <laughs> always are. Yeah, it's training. Oh, yeah. You know, it's training and train my mind to be that way. Um, because on a health perspective as well, well, people, most people die of stress. Like the stress causes heart attacks and illnesses, and it can even grow cancer. Some say. Right. Stress. So you can think of the stress hormone cortisol, but stress in your life is going to lead you to your grave, grave faster. Guaranteed scientific fact. If you've got stressful life, you're going to die faster. But a lot of stress, a lot of it is self-generated. Mm. It's because we're focusing on the things that aren't going well. Yeah. It's because we're thinking about things that could go wrong in the future that haven't actually happened yet. Yeah. It's because we're going in the past and replaying those horrible conversations we had with our partners, with our spouse, with our boss or whatever. And we're playing it over and over again so we feel terrible. So not only are we dwelling in the past, but we're predicting the doom of the future, you're sandwiched in with negativity. Right. We all know we should be living in the now. Right. You know? Yeah. So be present. Yeah, being present. It's not, it's not as easy as, not as, as easy it sounds, as right? Like, oh yeah, just be present. Yeah. All right. Present, you know? Um, but maybe it is. One of the ways that uh, I teach my clients to be present is focus on the breath. Mm. If you're ever, Eckhart Tolle is like a spiritual teacher. Love his work. I love his work too. He's great at this whole present business. Yeah. The power I'll, of now. Power of now. A new earth. Yeah. One of my favorites. But um, he says, to get yourself present, just ask yourself, am I being present right now? 
Because as soon as you ask yourself, am I being present right now? Well, yeah, you are, because you're yeah, like- so you're focusing on it. You're focusing on it. Mm. Another one is just to, if you ever find yourself thinking, the hardest thing is catching yourself not being present. But as soon as you do, if you just focus on your breath, that's the old traditional way, you know, from Buddhism, Hinduism, mm. whatever, thousands of years, see, if you want to be present, concentrate on your breath, that'll bring you present. So you've got these ways, but what I personally do this morning is I meditate every day. And that, that's training your brain to be present. It's literally like me and you training, you know, for a run or something, a 5K. Yeah. Getting up, running, training, training. So eventually, or a 10K. So eventually, it's pretty easy, you know. We don't, we could just get up and go for a 10K, no problem. It's yeah. not, not, not tough at all. Training your brain through meditation, through yoga, which is a sort of like a moving meditation, that trains your brain to be present. So at first it might be difficult, your head's going all over the place, and you're thinking about what happened, and you, you forget that you're meditating. But after a while, it's like running 10K. If you're training every day, yeah. it's easy. So then you don't even have to really concentrate on being present. You just are present. And when you are present, you're not thinking about everything that could go wrong in the future. You're not thinking about everything that went wrong in the past. So what happens to your stress levels? Boom. Gone. Dissipate. Dissipate. You know, it's more relaxation. When, so we talked about gratitude. What people would you say come to you? Would it just be people that are maybe overweight or negative or what sort of people? No, a, a bunch of different types of people. It's not, it's not usually a um, couple of type of people. So the first person is someone who just wants to be better yeah. at what they do. So like everything's fine in the life. The standard Joe blogs. Standard Joe blogs. Yeah. The man on the street. The man. Uh, not really man on the street. Right. It's usually so, more like an entrepreneur. Right. Okay. So it'll be like a successful entrepreneur doing great. They're just looking for that like slight edge, looking for the next level. So very successful people come. To yeah. So successful people will come to me definitely. But I do have um, programs for like the man on the street yeah. as well, they're more like online programs. Yeah. And they'll come to me because they understand that to be at the best and to be successful in whatever you do, it all starts with your mindset. Yeah. And they also understand that if you want to be at your best mentally, being at your best physically facilitates that too. And vice versa, if you want to be at your best physically, being at your best mentally facilitates that too. Yeah. So it's usually like really successful people, like some celebrities, but mainly entrepreneurs, who want to be at the best, will come and see me to get me in shape, mentally and physically. But also um, on social media, you know, I do programs for other people too, who you know, perhaps aren't super successful yet, but are well on the way to be. So why would you intent. say, why would you say that it's normally successful people or celebrities that come to you? Is it because they're in the spotlight quite a lot and, and they get that, you know, looking good and feeling good really impacts on their work and their presence? That's what that's the way I take it, but. Yeah, I think they just understand that if you want to be in the top of whatever you do, then you better, you better do everything you can to make sure you can get there. And one of the most obvious things is your mindset. So for example, uh, one of the people I worked with, super successful, um, like online fitness and social media around fitness. Mm. Okay, but at times this person would have a lot of self doubt in the mind. So when they were shooting videos, oh. um, when they was on stage, they'd have that you know that little negative chatter that you hear sometimes, a little bit of self doubt, and they come across the hobgoblin. The hobgoblin. Not worth it. Right. Exactly. And what can happen is that you seem a little bit wooden on camera and yeah. a little bit stiff. stiff and not really fluent and not really fluid and giving it your all. Yeah. So they know right away, like, man, I, I know I've got like, I could be way better than I currently am. Yeah. But I've got these little hobgoblins, if you like, yeah. holding me back. So I've worked with someone like that. And um, I've worked with... Oh, so would that be like state control as well? Yeah. 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 Do you want to explain state a bit more? Sure. So human beings, we have we have the ability to experience a wide range of emotions and a wide range of something called state. So, if 
me and you went and watched a scary movie right now, I could be in a state of fear. I don't like scary movies, right? And I might be a little bit shaken up, a little bit, you know, suspicious when I get out. I might be a bit paranoid looking around, just yeah. making sure everything's okay, and I might be really, really jumpy. Okay, that's a state that I've got in, okay? Doing the gratitude in the morning, mm -hmm. thinking everything I can be grateful for, that puts me in a state of openness. I'm feeling open, I'm feeling good, I'm like, I'm open to opportunities, I'm more open to trying new experiences, it's an open state. We also have states of confidence too. So that's where um, state control can be really useful, with confidence. So I'm sure you've been in a situation before where you felt super confident, you know, you're confident in your abilities, you feel good, you're in control, you got this. But I'm sure you've been in other scenarios where you don't feel so confident, you're a little doubting yourself, you're unsure, you're not sure whether you can do it, okay? Right, okay, well, there's a different state. There's a state of confidence and there's a state of fear, if you like, not, not very confident. Mm. Public speaking's a great one, okay? Some people can just do public speaking right away and they're confident, they just go for it, it's fine. Majority of people are really scared about it, you know, yeah. and it takes them a long time to get into it to be before they could be confident. Wouldn't it be great if, even though you've never done any public speaking before, if you could get into the state of confidence before you even got up on stage? So you could feel confident, you could act confident, even though you've never done it before, and get up on stage. That's an example of state control, and you can do this. You can use the, the state of confidence of absolute certainty, even in situations that you've never been in before. And it's by training your mind, training state, state management, or state control. One thing that we use in NLP Neuro Linguistic Programming is running through a scenario over and over again in your mind to have that outcome. For example, David Beckham would always picture kicking that, that ball that curved Mm -hmm. Swerve ball, and he'd do it over and over again, taking that penalty, taking that free kick, and he'd do it again and again. So by the, top, by the time he did it, it would go in. Because he's so certain, he's played it so many times in his mind, he'd be absolutely confident because his mind doesn't, they say your mind doesn't really know the difference between what you're imagining, mm. what you're visualizing, and reality. So if you're imagining being successful in whatever it is, taking free kicks or whatever, over and over again, your mind doesn't really know the difference, so the next time you go to free, take a free kick, it's like, oh, I've done this loads of times, like, of course I'm going to do this, no problem, bam. You think you can visualise in actually training as well with weights? Definitely, that's what Arnold Schwarzenegger said that he did, he visualised his muscles getting bigger. Yeah. And um, they've actually done studies, it's 100% fact, they've done studies where they've had people do nothing, no lifting weights, no training, no nothing, just imagining that they were lifting weights and the muscles were growing and the muscles had significant growth from it just through the visualization. Yeah, because I've had to visualize mine getting smaller. I just <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's great. That, yeah. So you can work on it with your mind and also with your body to get better results. Be top of your field. See, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I like. That's that almost. That's, what you're, that's what you're about. <laughs> yeah. About that. Cool. We are now in Mark's dojo, or gym, and we just want to really just talk to you about what's, a, what's an average day for you? Average day? Yeah. Uh, wake up, the first thing I do every day is I'll go and have a quick cold shower Yeah. to get me going. It's called, called thermogenesis. It's going to increase my metabolism. It's going to wake me right up. And it's going to get, it actually shows that it's going to increase your um, immune system as well. Mm. You're getting in the cold first thing in the morning. So I'll do that, wake me right up. Then I'll sit down. I've got a place where I always do my meditation. Just a couch in my bedroom. I'll sit there and I'll do anywhere from minimum half an hour mm. up to an hour of meditation. And then I'll get up. I'll go for a walk just around here in the hills and I'll do my gratitude. I'll think yeah. what I can be grateful for, do some breathing exercises, and I'll visualize what I want to achieve in my life, what I want to happen in my life. Yeah. And then I'll do some incantations, I'll say some, I'm like full on man, I'll be like saying some things, you know, like incantations, like telling myself, you know, I can do it, or you know, is that, I'm confident. Is that, 
uh, similar to affirmations. Yeah. Right. It's just like um, and then I'll get my breakfast. I, don't, I forgot actually, when I wake up, usually the first thing I do is I'll drink some water, some high quality spring water or... Yeah, you told some, me, which I really liked, you said, because obviously while I've been here, I've been cutting out the drinking. I do like a drink, you know, and uh, you said become a water connoisseur. Yeah. And I really like that, you know, know your waters, know your fizzy waters. And literally, because I haven't drank hardly anything from the time I've been here and we began for nice healthy meals in the right places. Instead of having a wine or a beer, you know, I've had a sparkling wine. Okay. Uh, no, Spark sorry, uh, sparkling water. Sparkling but water. That's why I said it, because in my mind, it actually is starting to feel like having a wine. Right. And I'm like, mmm, mmm. Right. Yeah, no, Because I have it in a wine glass. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. You get it it's in a treat, you said. Exactly. So, a lot of us, pretty much all of us, have been conditioned to enjoy certain treats. We call it a treat. Now for me, it was every time I went out to a restaurant, I'd like a, I'd have a drink. I'd have a glass of wine or a beer. That was my treat, right? Because I didn't, I wouldn't really have a min at home. Yeah. And I encourage, if you want to be at your best physically, I encourage not to have anything in at home. That's gonna tempt you. That's gonna tempt you. No junk food. Like if you don't want to drink too much alcohol, don't have it at home. Yeah. All right, don't have anything that can tempt you because if it's there, you're gonna eat it. Um, but one of the things I used to do is I like to go out and have a drink as a treat. Mm. So I was like, this isn't helping me mentally because having a drink slows me down, feel a bit sluggish, depresses you a little bit, not a lot, but just a bit. Yeah. And I wake up the next day, I'm, I'm just not 100%. It ruins your next day really, doesn't it? Ruins your next day. So I was like, okay, how can I treat myself in a different way? So I started becoming a water connoisseur. I, every time I go to a restaurant now, I'll get the highest quality sparkling water they've got and I'll squeeze in some lemon or I'll squeeze in some lime. Ooh, so an aristocrat. Aristocrat. <laughs> there we go. So now, every time I go out, my treat is some sparkling water. And the funny thing is, to you right now, it, it might not seem like a treat, but because I only do that, I only have sparkling water when I'm out, like mm. at a bar or a restaurant. So it's anchored. So an anchored state would be something you do a lot and you, you're just used to it, like a habit. Yeah. And you get the, the pleasure of, oh wow, I'm here now. I, I'm, I get, I'm allowed my, you know, like Sunday people eat junk food on Sunday right. typically. Right. So they're like, oh, it's my day of eating. I'm allowed to eat what I want. Right. Yours is having a nice sparkling yeah. water. Like I'm, I'm going out to a bar tonight. I'm looking forward to my sparkling water. <laughs> it you sounds can't weird. Wait for it, can I you? can't wait to go in ask the barman what, what sparkling waters they've got and to either try something new or get one of my old favourites and put a bit of lemon in, lime and enjoy it all night. It's psychologically, that's linked up just as much as a treat as beer or wine once was. It's about doing mind tricks on yourself to, to allow yourself to win. You did that yesterday. We went uh, for a meal and you, straight away, as soon as we went in, before they even said how many, like for dinner, you were like, what water do you, what water have you got? And I was like, um, um, yeah, and sparkling? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, you like, that was your first question. Yeah, yeah. Not even the food, it's yeah, just yeah. Like, what water you got? There you go. You were waiting for that drink. Yeah. But yeah, it's good. It's a, it's a good way to be. So one of the things we was also talking about is like how you can feel at your best, so confident, even more motivated, just feeling great is your posture. Yeah. So. I'm in trouble here, <laughs> consensus. So with you, Rob, You've got a good, good overall posture, but when I noticed you was a little bit, your neck was jutted forward slouching. a little bit and slouching slightly. Now a lot of top, Rob's tall guy, a lot of tall people do this without even thinking because they might be taller than all the friends, taller than the family. So in order to be less in, say or something, build rapport. In order to build rapport or to compensate to feel be less intimidating for people, sometimes they slouch down. Yeah, because I'm really intimidating, right? <laughs> yeah, so I find that, yeah, sometimes I don't, or I'll start leaning in certain ways to get as low as I can. Right. You know? And what we'll find is actually that, one, it's bad for your posture. So for you, I can tell you, I can tell you're going to have really neck issues and upper back issues I think here. I'm already getting them on one side. Yeah, I can tell because yeah. your neck's slightly forward. Right. Um, and for a lot of people, yeah, your shoulders could do to come back a bit too. Yeah. Because what we found is there's actually been studies that have shown that they put people in these suits, we pull them forward, and they found that the people who pull forward started to have depressive 
It's starting to feel a bit depressed and not good. Whereas people who have a chest open, open up your heart, being open to more experiences. These people feel more confident. Head up. That's why I say keep your chin up. Keep your chin up, exactly. Positive head up. Within a few seconds, you feel better. So there's things that we can do with your posture. There's exercises I can show you. I showed you one the other day with your chin. But there's these basic exercises that if you built into your daily practice or even just weekly practice, would bring your shoulders right back, your chin up. So not only would you have a reduced risk of neck pain, your neck pain would be gone, but also you're actually gonna be more confident person overall. Yeah. Feel more confident and look more confident to everyone else. So posture is real key to not just being physically at your best, but certainly mentally at your best too. Do you know what's really funny as well? Is I teach something very similar on stage. So it's about, I say to them, look down right. and think of a thought. Normally a negative one pops into the head and I give them a push and they move to the side, like stabilize themselves. And I say, now stick your head up and think of something positive. And they do it and I go to push them and they're solid. Right. Doof, doof. They don't move anymore. Right. And I don't know how that's connected to that. How would you explain that? But it's like the, the mind, the body are just like now stable and positive and stronger. Yeah. But yeah, I don't say. And even though I teach it on stage, I still, you know, am failing in being 100% perfect in my posture. Yeah. And it, it really does actually highlight that people need people to actually keep drilling it into them. Well, the thing is, you can, there's two ways about posture. You can keep drilling it in and keep remembering, oh, stand up straight. Oh, stand up straight. Oh, forgot, stand up straight. Or you can, I can show you some exercises where you literally train your muscles so it just does it automatically. So you don't have to remember it. You just are like that. Okay, should we go and do that then? Yeah.